Mark Thompson, my guest, he's a visiting scholar at Stanford University, a change in leadership expert, a savvy investor who lives a life filled with meaning. His new book, Success Built to Last, has uh, a foreword by U.S. Senator John McCain, so I assume he's either a friend or, or your publisher got him to do it. <laughs> well, I, Which reached, is it? <laughs> I reached out to both Jimmy Carter and John McCain and to people on both sides of the aisle when I wanted to find out what did high achievers actually have in common. I didn't want to find out the difference between the red and the blue. I wanted to find out if you're a high achiever and you've been hitting it out of the park for a couple of decades, not one hit wonders, but really doing it consistently, what did you have in common? And, and so he was one of those people. Okay, and the thread that runs through. Yes. What do they all have in common? Exactly. Passion. Exactly. They do have passion. They have a sense of purpose in addition to that personal passion. Passion is what drives you internally that you might do even if you weren't mm -hmm. somehow engaged at work. Right. That was something you really drives right. you. And then overlap that with something that also is matters to other people, uh, a cause that's bigger than yourself. It could be a customer in that company. It could be a community. It could be a career. But you want to have impact on something that is going to matter to other people at the same time that it drives your own sense of passion. Okay. And what don't high achievers tell us well, they don't about know this. success I and mean, survival? That, it seems that unconscious competence is kind mm. of what happens for real great experts. I mean, if you really ask them, you know, are you following your passion? Or for example, I asked Sally Field, the actress, one right. of the longest lived actress on the silver screen mm -hmm. and on the small screen. She they was, like me. They really like exactly. me. Exactly. So mm. she went through that humiliation. But I asked her, so you've been a leader from there because you've gone on to serious work. You've won big awards. Now you're a producer. How did you become a leader? And she said, leader? What's leadership? Mm. That's a non-thing. She says, what you have to do with your life is decide what you love, find a way to provide value to others so you have impact mm -hmm. on other people, and do that so exceptionally, and then you get beat up, but you get up again and you continue doing it even better and better, and then once you're in the field batting once in a lifetime hits over and over again, you know, when you're able yes. to repeat great success mm -hmm. because you practice so much, she says, then people ask you to lead, and you go, huh, what? Huh? <laughs> me? <laughs> me? You want me to lead? Yeah, the imposter? It's from the practice, so that it isn't okay. an, an imposter. So practice does make perfect. Where does luck fit into the game? You earn your luck. So when you're swinging over and over again to try to, to, to score, that the numbers play in your favor only when you try over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And the problem is that if you don't really believe it, if it isn't a passion, it is, if it isn't something that really matters to you, it's almost impossibly difficult to stick with it, right? Okay. That's a great screen Got device. Got it. Or when you really screw up, like Jack Welch. Yes, uh, Jack uh, Welch. Uh, GE, big, <laughs> right. big haunch at General Electric. Yeah. Uh, when he started on the floor, he, he nearly blew up the factory. <laughs> yes, that's I right. I hear tell. Yes, exactly. I read exactly. it in here. Well, you know, he's a, a guy who, for 20 years, built what was the most valuable company in the world, as measured by, you know, half a trillion dollars mm -hmm. back when he was CEO of that company. And he had had an ambition early on in his, in his life to try to run something. He did want to be one of the few leaders. And so he worked himself into a position of running this little innovation plastics factory. And the first thing he did <laughs> is blow the darn place up. And <laughs> he, he realized, this was the first time he realized, as tough as a guy as he is, that you don't want to kick somebody when you're down. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he was pretty down mm -hmm. far that day. I mean, basically, he was, his boss said, you've got to go drive and talk to my boss's boss about blowing this thing right. up. He said that was the longest drive and the I'm longest sure. night. <laughs> well, and you have to be accountable. You do have to you be just accountable. Do. That's the third, that's the real third leg on the stool. You've got purpose, which is what matters to other people, mm -hmm. and you've got passion, which is what really matters to you, overlapping with delivering on the goods. You mm -hmm. know, all this doesn't matter if you actually don't make your promises real. I understand. Uh, the, the dream is uh, free, the journey's not. <laughs> Indeed, yes. A John Maxwell, who I just saw recently. Did you? Uh, has made that point many, many mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. uh, what drives you? Well, you know, what drives me is that I came from a life that was very mixed in Silicon Valley. My mother had polio, so she was in a wheelchair mm -hmm. in the later part of life, had a hard time earning income for the family. My father wasn't really there to participate in contributing to the family income. My brother had a mental retardation from a brain injury at birth, so we had to give him a lot of care. And so I remember in, as a teenager in high school getting a job in part-time work, working as a janitor, to be in a position where I could contribute mm -hmm. to keeping us from being homeless, from putting... Uh, 
food on the table to clothing ourselves. And eventually worked my way through college, and eventually I realized at that time in my life that no matter what kind of a victim you think you are, and, mm. and you may have a lot of reasons to believe that you are a victim, that nobody comes to the rescue of a victim. That what we have to do is really be in charge of our own rescue. And that if you really look to create a life that matters, that is really what will transform not only your life, but also the lives and of other people. And take that MBA from Stanford and use it. <laughs> yes, right. So how did you get the moxie, the chutzpah, to sell a $100 million company or to, or to encourage others to, uh, you know, make billions in their companies? Like, what chip is that? Well, that, that ends up being, if you come from scarcity, then you mm. say, okay, what the heck? I really want to create something that's going to last. I want to create sustainable businesses. I want to, you know, that's what was missing in my young life is that I wanted the stability and I wanted security and I wanted to have financial success and I wanted to have, mm -hmm. I really wanted to prove myself. And, and I think that becoming a venture capitalist allowed me to be in a position where I could coach great companies, help them through their struggles, and then see a real economic benefit that would last for a long time. That's, I think the, the chutzpah comes really mm. from the sense of sure. pain uh, as well as the passion mm -hmm. that you and want to make And metaphysicians will tell you, and you've heard it before, that it's not what happens to you. It's how you think about what happens to you. And how you think about that makes everything to do with what you do in terms of action. Mm -hmm. you know, when you turn that thought into action, in fact, sometimes when you're feeling really badly, it's hard to really influence your thoughts. It's hard to say, I'm gonna be positive today. And yeah, I right. talk to these high achievers, and say, were they happy all the time? No. Mm -hmm. Did they feel confident all the time? No. What did they do? When they felt badly or they were knocked off a bicycle, they would get it back on the bicycle. And it's in the, in the process of living your passion, actually acting on it, that you start to feel better. Okay. It's actually kind of out of order. I think mm -hmm. people say, well, you think well, and then you'll produce well. No, sometimes you have to just act at your passion. You have to get involved back with your passion, okay. and then you start to say, yeah, I remember why I'm doing this. <laughs> well, your co-author, is it uh, Jerry Porras, he has what's called the Porras Principle, which is don't believe in words, only believe in, in action. actions. And, and he's a professor, right? He is a retired professor at Stanford University, really made a huge different in, difference in the field of organizational behavior and how companies tick and how right. people tick in those companies, a real mentor to many of us. And why companies tick is because they value their people. Exactly. And he I always think. talks about how the environment always wins. The place mm. that you work, make sure that when you're trying to pursue that dream or that interest of mm. yours, make sure that you have everything set up. Set up sure. a shrine to your dream. You know, a place, if you want to write a book, set up a place where you can research and right. write that book. If you I want to, that. you know, if you want to be in a place where you can make a difference, you know, make sure that you have all the tools available. Okay, and that. Stuart Emery was the first CEO of Est. Right, so How long ago was you. that? That was a little <laughs> while ago when we were all Estes. <laughs> right. And, and meditating on a log somewhere <laughs> or doing whatever we did. Uh, somebody said in here, perhaps a golf coach, Somebody, uh, if you take a man golfing or a woman golfing, you learn how they live their life. Yes, you indeed. You believe that? I think it's really interesting. If you watch somebody live their passion, if mm. you actually watch them in the act of pursuing it, you learn so much about them. And if you were to ask a loved one, for example, if you want a better relationship with a, a customer, but frankly, if you want a better relationship with your teenage daughter, Find out what their passions are. Find out mm -hmm. what they really care about. Find out what distracts them so much that they want to do it. You'll transform your relationship with them. You'll learn so much about them that you think you might have assumed that you knew. Okay, so when you talk to the Bill Clintons or the Steve Forbes or, or the Bonos, uh, they are definitely passionate. We know that. Yes. You get someone like Bono who's decided that he wants to make a difference in music and more. He sees that as a source of right. influence. Well, he says things like, we can end world hunger, folks. Yes, right. <laughs> Go, OK, Bono. Well, that isn't uh, We have the money to do that. that that's a big, hairy, mm -hmm. audacious goal, isn't it? We can it? end poverty. We can. And Bono has been able to, to have influence because he's taking a universal language as music is right. and of been course. able to have impact mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that's larger than his one life could otherwise have. And uh, the visionary we all uh, have thought about this last year, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, a person I knew in high school, a person that I came to respect in the year 2000. I was chairman of a little company called Rioport, which was popularizing the MP3 player. You know, that's a little oh, digital man. audio thing oh, in the man. iPod, you know? That's a good idea. And so Steve Jobs <laughs> comes and says, this is a geeky piece of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I've got that in my next book called Admired. You know, he admired Steve Jobs because he was able to bust through 
all of the, the horrible complexity and difficulty that is presented by technologists that make things geeky and hard. Mm -hmm. And we just want things to work. We want the phone to work. We want a home theater to work. We want everything to work. And that was his right. genius. And we you want know? our souls to work. And he, and he was. He a was. titch of a genius, I'm sure. Was he a nice guy? No. The, he was <laughs> the Edison of our times. He could be mm -hmm. a beautiful man. He could be a person who is very thoughtful in his interactions with others. In other moments, he could be a tyrant. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never describe him as just nice. I would say that he's either a genius who's generous or a person who's very impatient with fools and, um, or even impatient with people who were not able to get things done in the way that he saw that they needed to be get, getting done. I think yeah. a lot of people now aspire to be Steve Jobs, and I guess what I'd really aspire for most people to believe in is their own vision of what they can do. Mm -hmm. Don't try to be Steve Jobs. Try to find mm -hmm. your own Edison. You know, be creative. Absolutely. And be try to exactly have your own impact. Exactly who you are. Yes, right. And that takes guts, it as does. you know. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Appreciate your time. Nice meeting you. Mark Thompson with Stuart Emery, Jerry Porras. Success built to last, creating a life that matters. And thanks for being with us. Until uh, next time, go with the flow, or is it flow with the go? <laughs> See you soon.